Paxlovid could be a game changer that could alter the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. The antiviral drug is just one of a handful of pills that could slash hospitalizations and deaths, clinical trials show. This drug brings us is a little bit more closer towards the end of this pandemic. Right now, the options for treating people suffering from COVID-19 are limited. In Britain, the first antiviral pill was approved by regulators in a world first at the beginning of November. Experts believe many other countries will follow suit. Welcome to our COVID-19 special. Now, two years of this pandemic have made it perfectly clear. Lower your guard and the virus returns with a vengeance. And to keep it interesting, new, even more transmissible variants keep threatening to impact vaccine efficacy. If we can't ward the virus off completely, perhaps we can treat it. This could be an important new weapon in the fight against the pandemic, a pill called Paxlovid. According to its manufacturer Pfizer, the drug has a very high efficacy when taken up to five days after the patient first develops COVID symptoms. We are we're talking about an 89% reduction in um, hospitalizations and deaths um, for individuals symptomatic with COVID. Um, it's also a big deal because these are pills that are easy to take. Um, it's five days um, of taking pills twice a day. Um, so this means people can have these pills ready to go in their medicine cabinets. And if they then discover that they're symptomatic with COVID and they test positive, they can start taking the pills um, right away and not have to go into the hospital. Paxlovid acts as a protease inhibitor. The viral protease is an enzyme that works like scissors and allows the virus to replicate in the cells. The drug binds to the enzyme, disables it and thereby prevents the virus from multiplying. Compared to Molnupiravir, another COVID pill produced by US drug maker Merck, it has a higher efficacy. However, with a price tag of 620 euros for a five-day dose, Paxlovid doesn't come cheap. But Pfizer has said it will lower its prices for poorer countries. This is a small molecule and therefore an oral uh, drug in this particular case, which means that it's relatively easy to administer, short course of treatment, um, and uh, potentially doesn't have to be that expensive to produce and doesn't require people to go to hospital. So very suitable for low and middle income countries, uh, which is essentially our constituency. Now it's important to note the figures are only interim results. Other scientists will have to review Pfizer's data and the regulators will have to check the results. So it's unlikely that Paxlovid will be available before the end of this year. And for more, I'm joined by Timo Wolf, Associate Professor and Member of Covrin Infectious uh, Diseases Intensive Care and Emergency Medicine Working Group on COVID-19. He joins us uh, from Los Angeles. Uh, good to have you with us. Now, first of all, how big a role do you think uh, medication will play in the fight against COVID-19? Yes, um, hello from my side too. Um, we've recently seen um, a number of um, medications that are about to be to become available for um, for COVID-19, and um, likely these are not going to have um, a huge impact on the sheer case numbers on the epidemic, but they are going to be very important because what we experience now, um, for example, in Germany, where we've got another big wave of, of new cases, is that. They are um, very likely capable of taking pressure off the hospitals and, and the intensive care units because they, um, they mitigate the disease um, and, and make it a less severe disease if they're being used early enough. But they're also being, um, can be used as sort of a prophylaxis um, to um, bring down case numbers in case there are contacts to, um, to a COVID-positive patient. 
Right, so it would definitely be an additional instrument in the fight uh, uh, against the COVID-19 pandemic. But uh, we already do have uh, a certain amount of treatment. W what's wrong with the drugs that we're already using, like Regeneron, uh, Remdesivir? Uh, what are the issues there? Um, I, I wouldn't really say that there are any issue. Um, you have mentioned remdesivir, which is probably the first, or it was definitely the first substance that was licensed for COVID-19. Now, that substance has a very, I'd call it a very short window of opportunity because we can only use it sensibly um, um, in a phase of the disease where the patients already have oxygens, oxygen, but the, um, the disease mustn't be too advanced. And now, and now, that's obviously only effective for a very selected amount of patients. Um, and what we really need is uh, drugs that can be used in different stages of the disease. Um, and you've also mentioned um, a such called monoclonal antibody. Um, um, these are very, very effective drugs as we are learning um, more and more every day. And the only thing is that at the moment they have to be um, administered intravenously. So you need an infusion, which obviously makes it difficult if you have a high number of cases um, to access the patients that need it. And clearly, uh, these are not yet uh, drugs or ways of treatment uh, where, as a patient, you can just walk into a pharmacy, uh, buy a package of pills, and uh, that's all, uh, all wonderful. But that's what we're aiming at, isn't it? Yes, well, the availability of having oral drugs, um, you know, that can just be bought or can just be um, um, acquired by a prescription would would enormously facilitate the treatment, um, particularly because what we want to see is that patients are being treated at the very early stages and the first very few days of their disease. And, and obviously, the, there's, a, there's an aspect of time involved. So having an oral drug available would definitely be a breakthrough. Right. Uh, you've mentioned uh, the, the high uh, case numbers uh, across Europe, in particular in Germany also. A lot of that has to do with people not trusting uh, science, in particular vaccines. Uh, they will have to trust uh, medication. They will have to trust drugs. So what do we know about side effects, for example, of uh, molnipiravir or Paxlovid? Um, yes, um, obviously, for those two substances that you have mentioned, um, um, the, the, the study data are not available as yet, so we, we don't know too much about side effects, which, which is natural, because these um, substances are very early in, in their development. Um, um, for volumpiravir, um, some of the you know some of the study data were published at a conference just last week, um, and the safety profile generally looks good. Um, but um, I want to mention one thing is that we have monoclonal antibodies available, and what we must say is that their um, their tolerance profile is is excellent. So there are very very few side effects, and and those that that we know, which are essentially allergies, um, are, are very low in numbers and in frequencies. So, so that's um, altogether positive, and um, and I don't presume that you know that there will be huge problems with these substances. Final question, and very briefly, uh, when will we have the drugs necessary in order to treat the pandemic and manage it, just like the seasonal flu? <laughs> well, um, um, the answer that is is probably. Um, yeah, um, not horribly disappointing, but means that we need need to cover more ground. Is that um, with COVID, we will probably need several drugs for several stages of the disease and for several strategies. So we need vaccines. We may, and that is my opinion, need to do some improvement on our vaccines. Um, but we also need uh, antiviral drugs and inflammatory drugs. And um, it's hard to predict, but. Um, 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 hopefully, um, you know, throughout the next year, our arsenal um, of, of available medications and drugs will have grown um, so that we are much better able to manage, um, to manage this pandemic. And hopefully, um, these, these substances will be available worldwide, which is probably the, yeah, the, the, the harder one to crack. All right. Timo Wolf there, member of Corvin. Thank you so much for your time. All the best to you. Thank you so much. Time for another one of your questions now. Here's our science correspondent, Derek Williams. What happens if I don't know I'm infected and I get vaccinated? This is an interesting question for a couple of reasons. The first is that 
I couldn't dig up many studies that address it specifically, uh, nor were there exactly a lot of experts who've gone on the record about it in the media. But that's not actually too surprising when you, when you think about how tricky it would be to acquire hard data about sick people being vaccinated when they didn't know they were sick in the first place. Um, because of course, if you know that you have COVID-19, even if you're asymptomatic, the strict advice from health authorities is to wait until you've recovered or are out of isolation to be vaccinated because you certainly don't want to expose the people who are giving you your vaccination to SARS-CoV-2. The expert opinions I was able to track down on the question did agree on a few things though. Um, the first is that if you don't know that you're infected and you get vaccinated, it shouldn't make you any more or less sick than you are already. And the theory is that that's because vaccines seem to stimulate the immune system in somewhat different ways than the virus does. Uh, interestingly, large scale trials also provided evidence supporting that conclusion uh, with a key lack of evidence. Uh, among the tens of thousands of volunteers who received vaccines in testing, at least some would have had asymptomatic infections when they got the shots. And so if it had caused serious adverse effects, they would have stood out. But while it may not cause any, any direct harm, some researchers do think that getting vaccinated while you're unknowingly infected, that that probably causes the vaccine to be less effective. Um, that'd be pretty hard to prove though. 